Thank you, Don. So glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here, Martha. Thank you. I bet you have some initial thoughts on that conversation you were just hearing. Can I just get your your reaction to what what we're what we're discussing so far? Yeah, well, I am having major reactions. One is you shouldn't switch the camera to me, but go back to the amazing panelists. They have so much to say. Um, look, I was uh, the chair of the National County Medicine Subcommittee, the IOM subcommittee that wrote those six aims for improvement that Karthik talked about. Safety was listed first, then effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. I think we erred in putting equity last. Uh, I think one of the takeaway lessons from the COVID era, amazing uh, eloquence that you just heard from Karthik, we are, we are really finally, hopefully coming to a reckoning with how horrific um, the heritage of inequity in this country is. And so one takeaway I have is let's take everything we know about systems improvement, and we know a ton, uh, and apply it there with as much diligence as we're asking for the other dimensions of quality. Uh, I may, that, that may not be what you're asking me for, Martha, but it's, it, it's, time, it's time to get on this and, and, and as far as we can put this behind us by, by looking it in the face and dealing with it. You know, early in this um, conversation, we heard from Representative Liz Miranda about all of the social determinants of the health that were contributing to the inequities we saw inside the hospitals. And I know that's something the, the Brigham has tried to address, Karthik alluded to just a few minutes ago. What is the role for hospitals, Don, in dealing with the safety and quality issues that start well before a patient comes, walks into, walks into the front door. Big and different, different from what hospitals are thinking about now. That's, that's what I've come to believe. I don't have the burden or luxury of running a hospital so that it's easy to be glib, but I take my, um, I take my lessons from Sir Michael Marmot, whose book, The Health Gap, I've been talking about ever since I read it, it was, it was written in, in 2015. Marmot talks about social determinants. He has five of them. In his book, he analyzes the literature about childhood experience, education systems, workplaces, elder care, and community infrastructures. Those are quickly put the five categories he discusses. But then he adds a fifth one, a sixth one, I mean, and that is fairness. He means equity. He, mean, he means solidarity. He means a sense that we're all in this together. And he calls that the cause of the causes. And the more I've looked at this and, and really been forced to confront it by the modern sensibilities, I've, I've come to believe that until we feel together, and unified, uh, we we can't work on we can't work on the other dimensions. Now, if we do that, we're all part of the problem. We all we we have to join it. And hospitals, the American healthcare system, with 18% of the gross domestic product, cannot. It doesn't have the right to be a bystander to the social determinants that are causing people to come into those hospitals. That means a change in business models. It means a change in financing. It means a change in political energies. Uh, but I. I I've stopped feeling embarrassed at all about calling on the hospital community to become part of the solution to the problems that we're talking about when we, when we say social determinants. They'll say some of them, we're too busy or we have so much to handle or we're not getting paid for it. And I say, figure it out. Uh, I, I don't see a bystander possibility here. Well, you and I have, have talked before about some pretty unique collaboration that happened during the pandemic. Is that the path forward when you're looking at, let's just start, start with the social determinants. How, what would that look like? Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I fear I'm being glib and I don't mean to be, and we all have to think hard about this and get to better answers. And I'm gonna give you to that question, but the pandemic taught us that we're in this together. When someone wears a mask, whether someone wears a mask crossing, me, uh, crossing my path affects me deeply and, vi and vice versa. We can't deal with, with the, um, with the um, the, the medical consequences of COVID without teamwork, immense teamwork. Uh, hospital, we have to reach into communities and help you become comfortable with comfortable vaccines. We have to help people who are distressed by job loss. We have to come up with infrastructures that support people who are really at great disadvantage because of the COVID pandemic. That's which all of us, it's all of us together. And I, and, and I think you asked me, you know, in preparation for this, this interview about kind of the lessons and the one that keeps coming back to me is that it's that it's it's a lesson about solidarity about oneness which is not a very american term we experience solidarity in normandy 
in Normandy beaches, maybe, or or in you know real you know uh, uh, security threats. Uh, we're experiencing a bit in the in the pandemic, but we haven't used it in addressing uh, the, the the causes of illness. So it's it's a lesson I'd like us to read out of this that we're, we we've, we've got to work together differently. Uh, in pandemics and and uh, 21st century threats, regional responses are really crucial. And so beginning to think outside the, the walls of organizations and realize that regional assets need to be organized to, to bring to bear on public health issues and the kind of trauma we're experiencing in population, that's a lesson. And that's the kind of solidarity I'm talking about. So what would help um, us continue that solidarity? Are there are there new institutions that need to form? Are there payment changes that we need to see? Are there um, more cross-affiliation licensing agreements? Talk us through that a little bit. That's not a bad start to the list. I mean, I, I, have, I really believe financing changes are needed. They may not be, uh, they, they're neither necessary nor sufficient perhaps, but they sure would help. One of the chat, one of the people chatted in, Dan Hyman, I think asked about global budgets or, or uh, you know, global uh, or, uh, uh, health single, payer. Mm -hmm. single payer universal health coverage we would think differently if we had uh, national health insurance in this country we would simply think differently about how we're all in it together someone's gain becomes someone's you know uh, someone's loss is my loss too in that circumstance not when we're so fragmented so maybe we're not going to get there politically but that would help leadership matters uh you know they say the currency of leadership is attention and just like in the world of safety one of the big struggles we've had is to tell boards of trustees and executive suites that if you're not talking about patient safety, every meeting, every, every agenda, it's not going to happen. It's got to, you know, the currency of leadership is attention. I think the same applies to this sense of, of um, responsibility for the, the social determinants and, and ways to become engaged. I think we probably need new structures. We don't have uh, strong coordinated structures for regional responses. Uh, two examples that leap to mind. One is uh, the opioid pandemic. I mean, it, it really is a problem. I mean, you know, tens of thousands of people dying. We've never, we haven't come together as a community and say, all right, let's stop this one. We don't have, appear to have the structural support to do that. Another is housing. Uh, the, the, you know, we're one of the few wealthy nations that really tolerate homelessness and hunger, and we don't have the structures. When I was on the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force that, that that made recommendations to, to then candidate Biden. One of them is, I think this is in the Oval Office. We have to have a, a, a presidential level, level leadership for bringing everyone together around the concerns about equity. And I think we're, we may be starting to see that, but that's that structure is gonna be needed. So on timing, what is the inflection point? What's the pivot point where we say, okay, we know what we need to do. Now the change happens. Are we there now? No, I, you know, I fear that, um, I think you and I, again, in preparation, we, I, I had this idea of the difference between a slow emergency and a fast emergency. Yes, with COVID, we're going to beat COVID. I mean, everybody's mobilized now. We have a government that's got a brain and really kind of working hard at it. We have very superb scientific infrastructures, at least within this nation, if not around the world. We're, we're, the COVID will be behind us. We will, and we'll say, been there, done that, it's over. Not, that's not going to happen with a slower suffering of inequity and racism and its heritage as Karthik was talking about, nor will it happen with other problems that are very serious. Climate change uh, keeps me up at night. And how, do, how can we mobilize this kind of um, energy for collaborative work at the level of problems that are not quite so headline grabbing every day? And I, I don't know the answer. I hope COVID's a turning point in that sensibility. And I think if, uh, again, I'll turn to the government, if, if President Biden uh, is able to help us see the larger picture of what it's like to be a country where compassion and cooperation are, are at the top of the list, how much better off we all will be. I love take, I'll try to make it Nat's framing. Think of a world in which we actually help each other and how good that would be. And I think that's got to apply to the issue of racism and maybe it's a way to think. Uh, inflection point. I don't know, I, I sure hope so. I wanna stay on this point about um, urgency and the value of the intensity during the pandemic to produce a lot of rapid change and a lot of collaboration. Can you have those same results if you don't have the urgency? And I, I, if you can build in, Don, I'm also like, how do you deal with burnout against all of that? Yeah. Um... Okay, so there's two points there. Yeah. Uh, 
we need us we need to be able to establish a sense of urgency about problems that we've lived with for a long time and i don't know now you know the these the street camera that films the murder of george floyd helps where there's a kind of transparency around that tragedy that awful that awful murder uh, that does kind of create an opportunity to say wait one minute what's going on here so Yes, I think our new media and our new our new ability to watch and communicate with others could could help create a sense sense of urgency. Burnout, yeah, it's an interesting issue. Uh, so, uh, you know, right now in the pandemic, since we never built the infrastructures for psychological support to the healthcare workforce, instead, as Nat said, we frame them as heroes. Uh, they get tired and worn out. And one of the really nice things going on now is I think there are organizations all over the American medical scene that are saying, wait a minute, if we don't attend to the psychological needs and stresses that these very, very good, uh, good hearted workforce, including the people that serve food and, and drive the vans in hospitals, we really can't have a compassionate, successful healthcare system. So that, that's turning around. But now what about burnout for the more chronic problems like solving, like, en like ending racism or, or stopping climate change? I have a different view of that. I think the workforce wants to do that. I actually think one of the, one of the um, problems that actually, you know, colleagues have called moral injury is we, we, we disconnect workforce from things they really care about. And I'm pretty romantic about it. I think if we invited the American healthcare workforce become not just party to, but leaders in solving problems of the magnitude of um, racism, uh, I think people will step up enough. A lot of people will step up. And my, my guess is it may have the opposite effect from burnout. It may be finally I get to, to add meaning to my life. So call me naive, but I think there's a possibility there. I've seen it in safety. When you drill through the, the board of trustees or the C-suite in a hospital and finally get focused on safety, man, oh man, people will, will get engaged at levels that they've always wanted to be, but now you've given them a chance to do that. So I don't know if Karthik would agree with that, but I, I'm hopeful that maybe we, if we uncork this one, pe people will step up enough. John, how would you advise people to bring patients into the steps we need to take to emerge from the crisis? Uh, that's a very big question. It's well, it's the same as in safety. It's funny, I'm noticing analogies to the safety world. You know, we knew, we couldn't get we couldn't get momentum in safety without learning how to invite patients, families, and communities not just to report to us on what's going on, but to take the help take the lead on this. It's a really a shift of power. I think the same may be true here. And so, you know. Uh, I'm the wrong color, the wrong age, and the wrong gender to be talking about racism. Uh, we, we, we need to really elevate the voices and power of people who, who, have, who have been um, not had voice and power and agency. And I think that, that that's essential to this work. Plus, I, you know, in safety, often it's the patients that come up with the best answers. They, they, they can tell us what to do if we'll listen. I'm pretty sure the same would be true with respect to the, this area of inequity if finally people have the opportunity and the sense of the sense of power and possibility to speak up. My last question has two parts also. One is what else do you want to hold on to from the pandemic as a system change? Oh. And then personally, what do you want to hold on to? Uh, this is on the positive side. I'm hoping I'm getting some applause from Nat uh, Kendall Taylor, but one is a speed and uh, and proper standardization. We, we, we have become much more diligent about studying the science and trying to bring the science to bear at a global level. Uh, and I want to take that home. I think if we could maintain that sense of tempo and um, commitment to, to, to fact uh, that's emerged in the professional community anyway, uh, I, th I think it would really, really, really help. Uh, for me personally, um, I don't know. It's... Uh, you know, I grew up in a really, really small town and we all knew each other and we didn't, it wasn't always nice, but we knew each other. And there's that part of this COVID thing that, that to me, I find very ins potentially inspiring. So we're somehow, look, we're, we're all in this together. My biggest fear right now is we're gonna forget the global South, that uh, we're gonna fix it in the North and not realize we are equally responsible for what's happening, happening in, in, in countries with $2 a day incomes. And uh, that question will be called. But you know, we are we are a small town, aren't we? Uh, you know, uh, the, the planet. 
we're learning that, I hope. Don, um, thank you so much for being here, for your work and all of your inspiration um, today and, and for many, many years. Um, I'm gonna to toss it back to Barbara and Peter for some closing comments.